three, two, one. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today on PB Live. Uh, we have the first session of the World Spa and Wellness Convention, not live from uh, London, but live from uh, Canada, the USA, from the UK, of course, with Mark, with uh, from uh, and also from uh, from Greece with Marina and and Genia. So, so thank you very much, all of you, for joining. Um, I'd like to dive right in because we have um, we have forty five minutes with you, and we would like also to hear from all of everyone joining in uh, with a Q&A at the end of this session. We're going to be dealing with COPE and HOPE, how to cope immediately um, for your spa business, because in this uh, unprecedented, unprecedented situation where we're all in the same boat at the same time, uh, we will share with you the insights, uh, the experiences of some of our panelists today. This session will be followed by another panel at exactly the same time tomorrow with other speakers talking about the same topic. But as of now, we have Maggie uh, from the USA, Maggie Dumphy, the Director of Spa and Wellness Operations Americas for Hyatt. We have Genia, Genia Di Piero, CEO and founder of Qu uh, Cloud12 in the UK, a wellness center, very uh, innovative. Marina Efremoglu is the founder of Euphoria Retreat, one of the finalists for this year's World Spine Wellness Awards in the uh, uh, health and wellness destination. Of course, we have Mark Maloney, Managing Director of Professional Beauty, who had this excellent idea to take this uh, convention online. And last but not least, we have Frank Pizzicalis, the chairman of the iSpa Foundation from Canada and CEO, founder of Resort Suite. And if it's okay, I'll dive right in with the first question because Frank, as chairman of the iSpa Foundation, you have, uh, you are one of the few associations, if not the only one in the, in the world, to have data uh, from what's happening in the US and also with your international members throughout the world. So please, if you have some information about this, let us know how badly hit the, the uh, spa industry is. Thank you, Jean Guy. I appreciate uh, this and, and and congratulations on this. is a great forum. I think it'll be very valuable uh, for our industry. So uh, congratulations uh, to you and Mark and, and Claudia for putting this on. Um, so I spot immediately uh, as you know it was pretty clear the impact um, to the world uh, with with COVID nineteen. Immediately took action. Um, uh, first action was setting up a micro site. Um, which if you go to the iSpa website, uh, there's a hole right at the bottom, you'll see uh, pretty prominently the COVID-19 uh, microsite, and there's lots of resources there for the industry. Uh, under the, the COVID-19 resources, there's, there's a number of things, including um, CARES Act information, a spa industry resource partner uh, responses, uh, the CDC, uh, uh, WHO, all kinds of uh, data tracking. When I when I want to know what's going on, I go to the data tracking links that are provided within within ISPA, uh, federal government um, uh, communications, uh, AMTA, uh, private business resources, health and wellness resources. So a lot of really really valuable information in one place uh, for our industry. Uh, there's protection and guidelines. Uh, financial resources, webinars, and podcasts from across all uh, international associations, and uh, and also communications template uh, that spas can use. So lots of great resources there that that people should uh, certainly take advantage of. Um, iSpa immediately started to do, I would say, real time, um, essentially surveys uh, of our membership, um, and so started on uh, March 13th and our most recent uh, data we has as of March 23rd, uh, there were over 400 spa leaders that were surveyed. And, uh, and so we have about an 11 day period of information. Now during that time, uh, eight out of 10 spa respondents uh, had temporarily closed their spas and 16% of resource partners uh, had temporarily closed. Now these numbers, are probably closer to 100% now, at least for the spa operators. 
as you can imagine. Um, one third anticipate that they would have been closed for two weeks or less, and 20% uh, anticipate being closed for six weeks or more. And I would say, again, these numbers are probably going to continue to shift um, you know, as we go along here. It, the other thing is not surprisingly, 90% obviously felt that COVID-19 will have either a significant or detrimental impact overall to their business. 25% uh, of spas uh, had already laid off employees. And among the 75% that were remaining, we're using things like paid vacation and sick days before transitioning to unemployment. So obviously this, this is gonna to continue to shift as we continue to survey. Um, and then we see uh, obviously uh, things happening here. But what I will say is there's a lot of resilience within our spa community. Um, they are looking at creative ways to, uh, uh, to, to have their staff either salaried or hourly do uh, work deep cleaning the spa, um, evaluating retail inventory, looking at their business processes and, and making improvements there, uh, refreshing their space layout, selling and shipping retail items, curbside pickup, you know, all of those things. And even larger operations, maybe within hotels and resorts, are shifting spa employees over to other roles within the business, you know, restaurants and coffee shops, those sorts of things. So uh, lots, lots going on. And, um, you know, essentially, uh, communication is really key. Uh, we're finding a lot of the feedback we're getting is, you know, great daily communications and self care tips, uh, meditation resources, you know, all kinds of uh, great things. Uh, and again, some of the results of this are available uh, on the COVID-19 um, microsite. So, um, now, among the resource partners, 71% of transition to a work environment, remote work environment. That includes our team. Our entire office was closed on March the 13th, and everyone is working remote. Uh, we've been one of the fortunate ones that uh, we haven't had to lay off uh, anyone. We are committed to our team uh, through this. Um, you know, depending on how many months it goes for, that uh, we will, everyone will keep their jobs. So. Um, you know, that is something that we've committed to them. And, but we are different in the sense that, you know, we have uh, a very highly specialized uh, workforce, uh, not to say that others don't as well. Uh, but our industry has been disproportionately affected. Uh, it's fair to say every business and every way of life has been affected right now, but certainly uh, the spa industry uh, with pretty much full closures, um, you know, is, is a major impact. And so, uh, you know, through this, as we come out of it, we're definitely going to need to look at uh, a lot of different things as we uh, look to reopen. We don't have a crystal ball, uh, but certainly there's a lot of SOPs and compensation models and employee handbooks, sanitation standards, a number of things that will need to be looked at, um, you know, as we move forward. And certainly uh, iSPA is gathering that information and through the foundation, uh, looking at continuing to create resources uh, webinars and, and a number of things that uh, Thank you. will Thank serve you our so industry. Thank you so very much, Frank. Mark, to you. Mark. Mark, you're Mark. muted. Mark, you're muted. Maggie, I'm going to ask with this first off with you. How would you advise business owners and managers to save costs, yet care for their colleagues and associates who are paid not always high wages and depend on tips? Maggie, could you answer that for Maggie, us? Maggie, can you mute? Um, Maggie, can you... Maggie, you are on mute. Can you unmute yourself, please? Uh, Chris, is it possible as, as a host to unmute speakers? Okay, well, Maggie is, is going to unmute herself. I have a question for you, Jenya. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah, go ahead, please. Yes. All right, well, Maggie, Maggie is, is, is getting a better uh, connection. I will ask uh, her again your question right after that, Mark. Jenya, I have one for you. How would you help owners, managers evaluate their needs for cash flow in these troubled times? 
what to pay and what to hold on. Sure. Well, I would say that you should not be doing any payments uh, at this moment in time. So you should cut all of your variable costs. Um, you shouldn't do any cleaning. There shouldn't be no need for any flowers. Maybe you need a little bit of maintenance, but just looking at cutting costs right down. And then um, negotiating payment holidays with, with as many suppliers or anyone that you have on retainer. What I find that people are very supportive at this time, and even though contracts do not necessarily provide for that, um, they, they would consider your situation. And in the UK, the situation is a little bit different. So I know when when my um, partner, business partner, gives me a few holidays, they will get some support from the government, as would I. But then sometimes, of course, there's just a human element to all that. So I had to basically find out the situation about every one of my 45 employees, who lives as parents, um, you know, who has support from their partners, who's struggling with cash flow and on transmute case by case. Does any does any of the other panel have any workflow would like to share any cost cutting tips? Maggie, are you back on? Yes, I'm here. Can you ah, hear me? Yeah, now we absolutely can. go ahead. Okay. I'm not gonna move. So I'm just gonna stay right where I am. And um, are we going back to me to my question? Absolutely. Well, yeah, I mean, um, before we get on to your first question, I just thought, do you want to add to what Jenny has said? Do you have any cross-cutting tips? Well, I think what we all need to be doing now is what we're doing in our personal lives and looking, and again, this may have been covered, but I was I was disconnected. But work with our work with our um, with our, the, our landlords and our leases and our mortgages and, and um, put them on hold if we can. And um, so it's not about cost cutting, it's more about cost deferring because everyone is in the same boat here. And um, so again, if we can, if we can defer some of these, some of these costs that are out there, then um, when the time comes, I mean, we can hold on to our money so we can be paying our, our colleagues and associates now. Thank you. And would you, how would you um, do this in terms of, um, particularly on staff, now, how would you advise business owners and managers to save costs, particularly when it comes to, you know, their staff costs? So, as we know, most of our staffs are paid a, a commission, at least in the, in the States. If we can hold on to them and find some tasks for them to do, uh, some, some work that may be done, needed around the, uh, around, around the spa, and perhaps you can hire them at an hourly. Um, in in the, the United States, we're able, they're able to collect unemployment. Several of our properties are uh, that they're collecting unemployment and then our companies are adding a stipend to help them stay a little bit more whole so they can uh, so they can keep track of, of their of their expenses. And I think one of the most important things we can do for our, our colleagues and associates is is make sure that we're we're sharing business practices and financial practices. It's not always um, what they do best. And so some of the things we're looking at in our businesses, they can be doing the same things in their personal lives to to keep them and their families as whole as they can during this difficult time. If I can add about the um, situation in the UK, um, it, it's quite different because the government provided a support package for the job retention scheme. So essentially, we can place all of our employees on furlough, which means we receive reimbursement from the government on the um, 8% of their salary, up to £2,500 per person. Um, this actually means that not do any work so that creates a little bit of a challenge for me as i'm trying to move my operations online i've got a very limited number of employees who can work uh, and those who, who are on follow uh, we've uh, launched uh, a few initiatives to motivate them 
uh, of course, suggesting a lot of volunteering opportunities, uh, even if they're not delivering uh, to maybe elderly or, or the families who struggle. Uh, they can be placing a phone call, so they can be participating in an effort. Volunteering is promoted under this scheme. Also, trying to still engage them. Uh, we're going to have some virtual trainings. Um, uh, we're going to still continue to kind of reward the hardworking employees who've always had to play among scheme, and we're going to continue with that. We uh, suggest the staff to put forward some business ideas. We can reopen, plan uh, maybe an open party for both employees and, and, and our clients. So try to um, keep everybody motivated. It is very important keep everyone on the ball and, and um, qualified as well. So looking at some training programs as well from this time can be beneficial. So you're on some of the people that you've had to put on furlough, you are still giving them, putting them on training per programs. Um, so people who are on furlough, they cannot undertake any work. They can volunteer. I believe they can train, and, and we're still getting more details from the government. So they can undertake training, and we need to pay them for that, but they will still be eligible for the, um, the reimbursement of 80% of their salary. So for people not in the UK, the, the UK government is going to, re if we put, we can make people temporarily redundant and the UK government will pay up to 80% of the cost, up to a set amount, two and a half thousand, roughly $3,000 a month. Um, can I ask you a question? So if you put, what would you suggest on employers though? What, is there a bit of an issue where, so effectively you could be furloughed and be paid to do nothing, and then you would have to work, and then you would still be paid. You'd be paid to work. How would you get over that issue? Well, I'd say that those who will work, they will get hundred percent salary, while those who will then follow will will get eight percent. So there's a monetary incentive. We will definitely recognise the people who work very hard um, and we will motivate them and we'll, potentially you can also rotate people so uh, oh, yeah. you, can, you need to, to be um, out of work for three weeks and then you can swap might be not practical but that would be um, I suppose fair to, to all employees um, thank you um, Marina I know it's not your question but do you have any thoughts on this Marina? Um, I think that in me. Can you hear me? Yes, indeed. Yes. Um, yes. Okay. So right. in Greece, also the governor has taken up the cost, uh, paying uh, 800 euros to the businesses that uh, they, um, they were forced to close, like spas and hotels, like we are. So that is the one aspect. And then... Uh, People, what they are talking about is, um, especially in what we are planning to do, to see, to make, let's say, our own metrics of people that really, uh, this, uh, this amount is not a survival, it is a survival issue. And then finding a way to compensate them for more for that. So we will be more, at least for the first month, and we see how it goes for April. We will uh, try to see that people have more in need, that they may have issue survival, to to give them extra money. And we don't know how to do that yet. We have to find a way to do that because it's it won't be legal. But um, I mean, this is the idea that we're gonna do in you mostly in terms of need, what is needed. Well, that's very humane. I suppose a smaller business can do that, um, be more personal. Um, bigger businesses. Um, so Frank or um, Maggie, have you got any other as how to support their staff without... Eventually, we'll hopefully we'll all come out of this and we need our reputations as business people intact. How, is there any further examples that you can give? 
Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, the Canadian government is trying to, um, first of all, they, they want as, as few people to be furloughed as possible. So what they're trying to do is have a program. Uh, at first, it was 10% of, of people's salaries, but they immediately realized that that just wasn't going to make a difference. Uh, and they announced just on Friday that they're now going to cover 75%. Uh, as long as you keep them employed. So the details of that are still coming. Uh, but I think at this time as a business owner, uh, you do have to make tough decisions, but you also have to be uh, understanding of your team. And, and the more that you can do right now, uh, I know I sent, and it's all about communication. I sent a, a memo to our entire team. We have uh, uh, calls uh, throughout the week. And, and so there's lots of good communication and just letting them know uh, what we're doing to uh, give them some assurance, some security, uh, because there, there's a lot of stress and anxiety out there uh, in terms of what's gonna happen. And so we wanted to give them insights on what we're doing, be very transparent about our decision-making uh, and trying to support them and their families as much as possible. So, um, you know, I think everyone is trying to be as creative and understanding as, as, as we can be. Uh, to, to get through this together. And so uh, hopefully governments will assist small business uh, to, to make that happen. And, uh, and certainly you're seeing out there, um, you know, Maggie's uh, CEO, uh, Mark Hutzelman, you know, he, he uh, is speaking right out on LinkedIn and, and speaking to not just his own people, but uh, to, to everyone in our industry and, uh, and sharing some really uh, personal thoughts about what's going on. And I think, Today, business is personal, so uh, you know we have to take that into account. Mark, I see that there are quite a few questions for Q and A. Shall we get on with the next question? Yes, yes, indeed. Please, is that yours? I think that is you, isn't it, Jean? -Pierre? No, it's Was yours, it Mark. But I'll take it if you want. Uh, on, Marina, how do you suggest spas keep on and keep in touch with their clients? What type? What types of? Uh, insights or wellness tips do you share with your clients because i see a lot of spas frantically going on sell 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 mode which is you know why not an, 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 a tactic to still uh, survive with uh, retail online but i see more and more spas also create a human relationship with their clients to say that in, even in these moments of, of uh, distress they care for each other with lots of uh, content inspirational content as as Frank said, from ISPA members. So what do you put in? And then we'll hear it from Maggie and Jenya. Okay. First of all, do you see me? Because my camera... It's okay. We can hear you very well. But you cannot see me. No, but it's okay, Marina. Because if you, I see we, we can hear you. Go ahead. Don't worry. Go ahead. It's okay, Marina. We hear you. My camera also what's happening. Okay, okay. So retreat is to um, abstain a little bit to see what is happening because there's so much noise in the internet right now that you don't want to be there and selling another product. This is not the approach we we decided to go for. So we decided to offer real value and not with a hidden uh, agenda to make that amazing. So replace physical contact by virtual contact. But at the same time, we want to keep a personal relation, relationship, especially with clients that uh, they have participated in our retreats and they are repeat customers. So we're planning to have um, through emails or sometimes so, uh, with WhatsApp group, for especially for people that have participated uh, in our retreats, to have a personal contact with them. Um, and in, in, in a way, we are a better place to do that because it is our philosophy is not just a physical aspect of the whole thing that you need the physical presence to be there, but we also are dealing with the emotional support and the spiritual uh, reason reasoning for why this is happening. So this we will uh, we will go out live with a free webinars, not just it won't be just webinars, it will be like a retreat, like a virtual retreat. Um, and then we will offer all the aspects of euphoria methods 
So thought includes includes um, the spiritual connection with meditation and and trying to find what is the meaning because of what is happening because it's not just big business. Here we are seeing the world really changing and we have to understand what is happening and we have to understand how each one of us can support that, how each one can be really the best we can, which is in a way uh, why we founded Euphoria. Um, we will also support through um, tips in terms of immunity, in terms of uh, yoga, in terms of uh, cooking and all that. But the core of what we're going to do is hold virtual retreats. So it's not just webinars. It is a way for the people to really feel supported and be heard and guided to this time. That, that's a wonderful idea because in this time where Zoom and Skype are flocked with uh, webinars and sessions and calls all day long, um, you are going to go beyond webinars and virtual retreats. Before we hear it from Maggie, Jenya, I know also I you have moved a lot of your operations online especially with, with uh, yoga classes, kids' classes. Can you explain that? Yes, I'm part of the businesses that are doing webinars and live Q&As. As, and as much as I don't enjoy doing live Instagram, um, you do all it takes um, for your business to stay relevant and, and, and to survive and, and to spread the word. Um, you know, we're a wellness club and I'm a herbalist and naturopath. And for me, it's really important to spread the knowledge about healing powers of plants. And I'm doing some demos of traditional remedy recipes. Uh, you know, I want people to actually buy some horseradish, garlic, apple cider vinegar and make those at home without having to rely on deliveries and having to rely on, on <coughs> which are also running low. Uh, we um, we are doing yoga. We um, well, we have a spa and a kids club as well as grocery and wellness clinic. So we're trying to support all of those clients with some informational pieces. I am doing as a holistic wellness hotline, so answering questions every Wednesday. Uh, if people have any concerns or, um, you know, the reality of it is modern medicine and, and pharmaceutical medication can't really do much for prevention. So you have to turn to health and lifestyle and healthy diet. And going back to the roots and spreading this knowledge uh, is, is very important for me. I don't believe that any of us can make money or should try to during this period. It's more about you know trying to do what we can to, to spread the knowledge and, and help each other. We, we are in it together. And the only way to come out of it is, is to stay together and support each other. Thank you so much, Jenya. Uh, Mark, uh, I'll be cheeky enough to ask another question before we, you, I, I, I pass the baton to you, my friend. Um, yes, it's true, Jenya, it's, it's, it, it, it's, it's not a moment to, to be uh, super business focused by selling, selling and going for retail, although some spas are doing that. And yesterday there was a great session from uh, one of the uh, UK trainers of Guineau, uh, giving insights and, and, um, and tips on how to do an online consultation when you're an esthetician at home and you want to stay in touch with your clients. So this, this also helps. But my next question is for, for you, Frank. Uh, two years ago, you were in London and you gave a fantastic presentation about what people should ask more of their spa software, how they should dig deeper into the way they operate their business. Because you said at that time, a lot of money is left on the table. And with most of the spa owners, most of the spa managers always saying they're deep into daily operations, the daily grind, they don't have the time to think in advance. Well, Right now, we have a lot of time. Can you lead us through on your insights on how they should take some time to think more and prepare for yield management, menu engineering, and specifically what you touched on back then, which was dynamic availability and dynamic pricing? Yeah, it's uh, certainly not easy to talk about uh, you know, revenue management at a time when there's zero revenue coming in. But certainly, you're absolutely right uh, that it is a perfect time to actually 
sit down and analyze your business. Really look at uh, your the structure of your menu. Really look at how you sell and and as you're booking treatments, um, you know, should I be doing that that um, you know that full facial or a wax service, which might use the same uh, you know spa therapist at that moment, but you know, really, should we be trying to um, you know, push more towards and using dynamic availability uh, during those peak times to make sure that uh, we're doing services that will yield us the highest profit, but also have a, a, a higher drag on product sales. You do a high value facial. In many cases, they want to use the products that were actually used in that facial that makes their skin feel so good. So looking at how you do business is, is a perfect time right now. Go back and analyze the trends, analyze your, your menu structure and you'll and, and really break it down by by profitability on each and every service and I think it'll be an eye-opening exercise and then it'll start to I think guide you in terms of what uh, you should be making available uh, dynamically uh, during certain times when you've got low occupancy and times of high occupancy where you could have three times the treatment areas and still could not meet the demand and you're turning away a lot of business so just making sure that as you come out of this, you come out stronger. Um, the one thing I will also say, I'm also a spa consumer. And uh, the one thing that as consumers we can all do for our local spa is uh, buy a gift card uh, today. Go and spend $500 or whatever you can uh, to buy a gift card and at your local spa because it sends a real message that, uh, first of all, gives them much needed cash right now. Uh, but it also tells them that, uh, we value what you do, and and the sun will come out again. Business will return. So just giving them that uh, that that confidence that you know we we understand what they're going through, and uh, and we're here to support. Yeah, them thank as you well. so very much, Frank. I believe what you said is even more important when so many spa managers, owners, directors are considering when it is time to reopen, not reopening six days a week like they used to with the regular closing on Monday or Tuesday. A lot of them, if they take inspiration from what's happening in Hong Kong right now, maybe it will be, um, it will be interesting to only reopen three days a week or four days a week for just the first weeks of, uh, of, uh, of reopening. Later, uh, Thierry Malray, one of our keynote speakers, uh, touching on the social and, e and economic um, consequences of the pandemic. He will speak at 5 p.m. UK today. When I asked him the question, how do you think the economy is going to switch back on? He said, it's not going to switch back on. The economy, the global economy is like a, nucle a nuclear plant. It, will, it, it takes months to really grow to the point where we were, and it will take months to restart. Um, it will not shut down immediately. Uh, so as we will be you know, progressively restarting, you should also progressively restart and make the most of the few days that you will be having. Mark, back to you. I'd like to add um, that is, um, you know, we don't know what's going to happen at the end. And of course, the absolute ideal would be to train our staff and, and have our managers plan for yield, yield, maximizing yield, um, and all these things we absolutely want them to do. But of course, if they've been furloughed or if the business needs to furlough them, it's a very tough one. But, you know, clearly um, the idea to have um, training, um, if we can train them, if we can train them, if, even if they're furloughed, that would be, that would be an, an, an excellent idea. There's so much that we can do that I think all business owners want to do. But, of course, it's, it's a question of do you, can you afford to keep the staff on at the same time? We also don't know in certain, you know, if, if and when we open, we don't know whether the government will allow what the social distancing rules are. But I am sure that there are certain immediate treatments that consumers will want that perhaps we at spas may want to think and adjust our menus in the sense of, that you know, I will certainly want my hair cut in a few months' time, um, and there are things that we will want that perhaps we might 
spas may look at changing their treatment menus. Does the panel have an idea on this? Any 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 takers on that comment? Um, I would. Uh, um, I think that um, close physical contact won't be the first thing that uh, our guests would like. So I would suggest to change that with more of um, emotional support groups, doing good things as a group together, keeping social distances at uh, the same time. But I don't see one-to-one -one massages being the first thing that uh, our guests would like. So I think that we should go to a model that we will be working together and finding other ways to coping with what has happened. So more of the emotional and uh, physical distancing. Um, you know, like doing yoga in a big, big studio with a lot of uh, room, not just one yoga mat next to each other. Um, I, I think there might be some other ways. So, for example, um, keeping your hygiene up. I know our clients appreciate it, that our therapists use masks and gloves in, in some cases. Also, we use the UV lamp, uh, which, which has anti-viral, antimicrobial properties to disinfect rooms every time. So I think it's, it will be important to demonstrate that you keep your hygiene up. I, I think it, it's also very important to bring the form about what the world will be like post-COVID and potentially look at some services that will be more popular than others. Potentially, there will be more wellness focus, so the spas will link wellness with, um, you know, traditional massage might benefit, and, and I do yoga or bone bath, uh, some, some mindfulness focus activities might be popular. Um, the world definitely will be more digital, so considering maybe to, to have an app uh, if you don't already. But also, I think now is the time to turn every stone and renew your contracts. I think many SMEs found out that the insurance didn't cover this kind of crisis. So having provision for, uh, you know, notifiable diseases and, and COVID in particular, with the employment contracts, most contracts did not have layoff provisions as, as, as um, you know, harsh as it sounds review your supply agreements and, and procedures and, and in play handbook. So now, now is a good time to kind of strategize and, and potentially identify new trends and new products. Um. Um, Mark, if I could say one more thing on that. Um, I think as well, we're really going to have to look at guidelines, a hard look at sanitation guidelines and reassuring staff and consumers uh, that it's in that it is an increased focus, right? Uh, just to, to get that that confidence back, really for both sides, it will be an adjustment period, and um, and so you know we, we just really need to to understand um, you know also the mindset uh, of both the consumer and and Thank our, you, our Frank. providers. Um, actually, I have a spoiler alert for this coming Friday. We have a session uh, with four fantastic. Um, um, spa professionals who have been through catastrophes. I'm talking hurricanes. I'm closing uh, everything shutting down in uh, Cairo when the Islamic Brotherhood came, came in power. And, and one of the things that uh, Virginie Fliegens, who is currently opening the Bulgari Spa in Paris, was saying about these guidelines for sanitation is that right now, as she was opening a spa, with coronavirus, she's rethinking completely the SOPs, the, SOPs. the amenities that she's going to be using. Do you have um, a jar where you put your hand in and you get your almonds and, you, and your dried apricots? What do you offer in single packets? So everything that was coming in bulk to uh, avoid single packets and, and have the, a, a very light footprint on, on ecology uh, now is going to come back into play maybe with, with the you know, sanitation, safety, uh, and the footprint on, on the world. So there's more to come on this on Friday. Mark, I see we have maybe four or five more minutes. Would you like to take a question from Chloe and Chris from the, the, the PBTV? Yeah. yeah, one of the specific questions we've had from Maria Sonina, Sonina sorry, Maria, if you can hear. In, in Moscow. Uh, in Moscow, um, is do can you... 
have you got any tips for how to get support from the government? I, I'm not sure we're an expert in Russian um, support, but um, from the UK, um, does anybody have any tips for how they can get um, government support in any of their jurisdictions? Is, can you outline the panel what that support might be? Um, Jenya, you start first, if you don't mind. Sure, I'm also a Russian, so I don't have much insight into the Russian government, but I think for all of us it's important to write to your MP, MPs. Um, potentially, you know, if, if this is more global issue, start a petition, um, make your voice heard. Um, but, you know, in, in the UK, I, I think the most effective rule is having um, constituents appeal to, to the MPs. I would like to, to, to really to raise my hat to Frank again and to Lynn McNeese, the president of the ISPA um, and also the, the board of directors of ISPA because very early on they have uh, prepared um, a, a very serious and well-documented document that they're presenting to governors, senators, to the, the House with the relief package. Um, Frank, would you like to let us know a little bit about what you're doing, what you guys are doing uh, as far as lobbying and being the voice of of the spa in, in the US, but also worldwide? Yeah, well, I think, I think the, the most important thing is, is obviously uh, also finding, uh, you know, researching uh, obviously through our members, but also uh, we're doing research uh, through consumers, through our uh, PwC research on consumer perception. So I think coming out of this, it's going to be really important work uh, to get an understanding of uh, really the mindset of the consumer and what we'll need to adjust uh, as an industry moving forward. So, um, you know, from, from government resources, again, that COVID-19 uh, resource on the iSpot website, uh, there's a lot of different links and we're going to continue to bring in, you know, globally uh, from the UK, from Canada, from you know, other parts of the world, obviously the U.S. as well. And, and so having, you know, all of that, that information in one place uh, again, can be a, a real resource for uh, for spa operators uh, in terms of you know how to uh, access either uh, government support um, and and other kinds of information so much, to, to help them. Navigate. I believe we have a question from Sarah Waterson, but uh, I know Marina yep. wanted to, to to say something about yeah, let, this. Let Marina first. Marina, what would you say to the the last question? Marina, are you there? Looks as though we. No, we can't hear you. Uh, and unfortunately, Mar Marina, unfortunately, we, we oh, seem to have a weak signal from you. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, go, go ahead, go ahead. Please repeat. Yes. Okay. Okay, so uh, what I'm wanting to propose, and I think it has to do with uh, our willingness as businesses and, and as our wellness expertise to change our model. And uh, I think that what uh, part of the world would look after, the, after we kind of reopen up is a sense of cooperation, is a sense that especially places like Euphoria or other places that uh, aspire to create uh, real well-being, we have to find a new way to cooperate between us and not uh, continue the old competitive model. So what I wanted to suggest is to create, and that could come from uh, you guys, from World Wellness as an example, or it's something we already talked with Healing Hotels of the World, to create a unified platform that uh, spas and uh, healing hotels are going to provide free content and they're not going to be a hidden agenda. So anybody can choose and we can have power as a voice, as a trusted voice, because we already have a history, so we're not coming from nowhere. But that would be a real service, to have a unified uh, virtual platform. Thank you so very much, Marina. So, Mark, would you like to take the last yeah. question from Sarah before we have to conclude? Do we have the time? Yeah, I think we have, we have time for just one more question. I'll, I'll just, um, Sarah Waterson, can okay. one of the panels speak about memberships and, and how memberships could help financial recovery in the bottom line? Um, Maggie, do you want to take this one? 
or, or Frank. Maggie, do you want to go? We haven't heard from you much. I think Maggie wasn't able to get okay. back in. Frank, she, she, she's in. What I will say, and she's unmuted. Membership, Maggie. Memberships are um, pretty key, right? It's a recurring revenue stream. So it, it's, it's just that, uh, that assurance that you know that that revenue, you know, month over month is going gonna, is gonna to come in. Um, and so now you might have to freeze some memberships during times like this. Um, you know, so it depends on what you offer. But to Marina's point, if you're offering some really valuable content, uh, people are going to see that they're getting value of it, even if they aren't able to use your facilities during that time. So I think the membership model, um, uh, again, creates a stickiness with your, with your business, with your operations. It's not something you do once a year going to a spa, but it's something you incorporate into day-to-day -day life. So I think mem the membership model in a lot of different ways uh, is, is very important, uh, obviously, for spas moving forward. And, and uh, uh, you know, Jenya can certainly talk about certain within her business, some of the business models that she's explored as well uh, to see what would work, you know, in, in more of a urban uh, spa setting. Um, Jenya, have you got any comments to say? Sure. Um, you know, through our membership model, um, it, it, it starts with the drawing, uh, and the members are free. free. Um, um, and this is mainly a very great for the kids to have a work with members. Um, so, one of the ideas, and we haven't decided yet, is still um, the situation is still unfolding, but one of the ideas, rather than freezing memberships, uh, to give this credit back in spa treatments or, you know, other adjacent services like F&B. So if you're a spa, you maybe are going to give it back and give vouchers so that you haven't completely lost that revenue um, rather than kind of freezing and, and um, potentially never getting this money back. Mark, you're muted. Mark, you're muted. Mark, you're muted. Um, if I was a, view, a member of a place or a spa and I could visit the spa, I would. I might be asking for a, that membership to be frozen. Um, you know, have you? What have? You, what are you dealt with on that side? I think we will either end up freezing or giving back this credit in in food and beverage or, or spa treatments so it will be either or and, and I know um, there are some uh, members clubs in London who have frozen especially teams and then some others um, like Circle House and Annabelle's uh, that are giving it back in um, food and drink credit so you can do either I, I think we will continue to provide online content and support our members um, even if we freeze we just want to help them out, even if there's no revenue at this stage. Um, but I think freezing might be a, the most realistic option if we stay closed for three months. Well, uh, on that note, I'd like to, uh, on, uh, Mark, sorry, on, on that note, I'd really like Mark, to, to close the session because... Um, uh, unfortunately, Chris and, and the other speakers are waiting uh, also to, to start in about 10 minutes. Uh, interesting that we, we end up on freezing uh, something and freezing memberships because uh, a lot of the time when we are in stress, we, we are in fight or flight or freeze. And I believe with all of you today, we were in a place of uh, pause and plan of, uh, of, of you know, um, dress and digest and also prepare for the for the next part so thank you so very much today thank you frank maggie jenia marina and especially you uh, mark for organizing this online convention um, i was happy to to help prepare it my name is jean-guy de gabriac founder of the world Winners weekend thank you so very much chris i believe there's a lot of um, more uh, further um, sessions after this one to the we have Absolutely. We have we'll, have two more. Well, we'll be back at, uh, I think you'll be back at five, won't you, with Thierry Jongi? Absolutely. Uh, a, a, a great session, one-on-one -on -one session about the social and economic impact of this pandemic. So stay tuned for more. And thank you, Mark and PB team, for this great effort. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you all the